Happy Saturday and welcome back to Conspiracy Cats. Yes, please check out Paul Douglas's YouTube channel. Link is in the description. Anybody interested in playing a musical instrument or who already can, you are going to learn so much from him. He's also one of the nicest guys I've ever met and he's a Conspiracy Cats subscriber. Unbelievable. Antonio Subrats has responded to me. My response to him will be out on Tuesday. He's challenged me to answer a series of scientific questions. We're going to get very, very scientific and technical on Tuesday. At the end of this video, we're going to get scientific and technical with a flat earther called Fuck It World, spelt with a PH. He's a nice guy, so I'm going to be very nice and polite with him, which means for the next five minutes, it's time to get really daft. So please welcome some of my favourite people on the planet, starting with Del. Hi there, people. And it doesn't stop there. Peter and Pete. But hello, 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 um, hello, um, hello. But hello, 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 hello. Yeah, all right, boys, don't milk it. Um, and if this wasn't exciting enough already, please welcome for his first time on Conspiracy Cats, Flat Earth Sensation, D Marble. All right, what's up, folks? At least pretend you're excited. Anyway, a couple of weeks ago, I let go a massive fart when I was speaking to allegedly Dave. And I know this is the third week on the trot, but I just want to mention it one more time. Yet again. Yeah, sorry, Dale. But the reason I've got to mention it is because Peter and Pete got in touch. They were that impressed. And Pete has been practicing his impression of what that fart might have sounded like. Now, I know he's a little bit nervous, but he really wants to do it. Are you ready, Pete? Now, now this is the first time that we've actually done this. Don't worry about it, mate. You don't have to be spot on. Let's hear your impression. <laughs> no! That is brilliant. D Marble was actually sat next to me when it happened. Um, what did it really sound like? Loud sucking noise, maybe a whistling sound with all the air rushing out. Well, I'm not sure about the whistling sound, but definitely you were right about the, the air rushing out bit. Air's going to be rushing out, period. Yeah, okay. Don't labour it. Anyway, before the show, we came up with a plan as to what you might be able to do if I was about to fart again. Uh, look, there's not going to be any sticking a finger in the hole. And... All right. I won't make you do it. Um, but Peter, if somebody did do it, can you imagine what that finger might say? I'm stuck. Can't go anywhere. I am embarrassed. Oh, come on, Dell. It was a decent enough impression. Um, D Marble, any more thoughts on this? The whole idea of being able to just plug the hole with your finger, um, that's like terrible. All right, fair enough. But as Luke would have it, I'm about to fart now and I don't know what to do. It's a dangerous situation. Yeah, it is. Del, any help? Must be contained. Right, I'll lock the doors. I'll be back in a second. Okay, now that situation's under control, we're going to continue looking at the idea that the practical demonstrations presented by conspiracy theorists don't really have any scientific substance to them and are often uh, a product of the misunderstanding of the actual heliocentric model. Now, this is something Peter and Pete, as flat earthers themselves, are really, really interested in. What do you say, Pete? A lot of flat earthers, a lot of flat earthers, like to have evidence. Yeah, they do. But the problem is the evidence that we've been seeing, in fact, just in last week's video, looks like this. And this. And this one's my favourite. Curved water on a flat surface. But before we get to a slightly better demonstration with Fuck It World, we've got a new cat in town. Let's check him out. Hey, YouTubers. Let's get ready for a science lesson. This recent flooding in Houston has really gotten me thinking about how many people still think the Earth is round. About 99.9% .9 of the world's population. Here I have a normal lemon. Me too! Now when I pour water, like it's raining, the water just falls off of the lemon. No, it doesn't. Oh, not again! Now... I have here a plate, a flat plate. You show off. Now, if I pour the water onto the plate, interesting. Well, I see where this is going now. Curved water on a flat surface. As you can see here, the water pools up. Try me. I think we'll leave that there. Conspiracy cats. I don't think you can actually play those guitars, can you? 
Listen, pal, I'm about to do some proper science with Fuck It World. I haven't got time for this. Right, that's it. Guitar battle, now. <laughs> Um, actually, let's not be hasty. Um, I've got a video to make. Um, I'll see you later, Paul. Alright! Just get some more practice before you're ready to take me on. Now, we're about to get very serious, but before I do, really, check out the link for Paul Douglas's channel in the description. He really is the best musician I have met in real life, period. Even Peter and Pete thought so. Check out their reaction while he was doing his stuff. Cool. But now it's time for Dell, D Marble and Peter and Pete to go home. We're going to look at uh, Fuck It World. I keep calling him Fuck It World, but it's called Fuck It Word. Um, sorry. We're going to look at his video and how he tries to distinguish between density and gravity. Now, Fuck It Word I've met numerous times in the comment sections around YouTube. He really is an extremely polite individual. So I hope you don't take this in a disrespectful way and I'd love to hear a response from you. Let's hear what he's got to say. Hello Flat Earth researchers, debaters and debunkers. I'd just like to use this Cartesian diver here to show how gravity based on the mass of the Earth is a complete fallacy and that we do not even need to consider how things get drawn to the Earth if we are not concerned whether we are on a spinning ball and we might fall off or get spun off. Everything depends on the density and pressure of the element that we are in. So, a Cartesian diver is a, a toy that I often make with my year seven classes around about Christmas in those Christmassy lessons. And it's a really good model to demonstrate how a submarine actually works and controls its height. But let's see uh, what Fuck It Word does next. So if I add some pressure to the bottle by squeezing it, what will happen is the lid goes down. All right, yeah. It wasn't suddenly affected by gravity, it was just a change in the pressure around it and the equilibrium of the two being put out of balance. So if I release the pressure again, it rises up. Okay, so it's all to do with the amount of space that the medium is taking up, uh, the, its volume, and this, the, the volume of the air inside here, and the uh, density of the different mediums and the object. Okay, so fuck it word. Um, again, please take this in the respectful tone it's meant. You are taking the Nathan Oakley route of looking at an independent variable, a dependent variable, and then there is your conclusion without asking any further questions. So here, your independent variable is, is increasing the pressure and therefore the density of the Cartesian diver, and we'll look at that science in a minute. Your dependent variable is the movement of the Cartesian diver, and the conclusion you're drawing is that as I increase the density, the Cartesian diver falls, therefore no need for gravity. Okay, so we can also make a new equilibrium where we have the uh, lid kind of uh, halfway. If I just adjust the pressure a little bit, we can keep it suspended there. Okay, all right. So of course this is by me artificially adjusting the uh, Density, because I've re slightly reduced the volume that the water takes up and put it under more pressure. Okay, so the same thing happens in the air. Okay, so let's look at the science we agree on before we talk about the science we disagree on. We agree that a Cartesian diver is a little device that has some air trapped inside it. Now, when you squeeze the bottle, and you increase the pressure, some of the water is forced inside the Cartesian diver and that compresses the air inside. So now we have the Cartesian diver with the air that it had before plus an extra bit of water that's been forced inside it by the pressure. What that does is that increases the, the mass of the Cartesian diver. Now density is mass divided by volume. So if I increase the mass, of that 
diver of that volume, I'm going to increase the density. And a Cartesian diver works because when you set it up, the density is only a little bit more dense than the density of water. So just squeezing it a little bit and putting a little bit of water in very easily makes it more dense than the water and the water sink uh, and the Cartesian diver sinks. That's the science that we agree on. So what we actually disagree on is when you stop asking why. You've seen an increase in density causes the object to fall and you've stopped asking why. Let me give you a, an analogy. If I knew a 400 pound, three foot tall woman, morbidly obese, if she said to me, I've started losing weight since I went up to 10 meals a day, I wouldn't draw the conclusion that eating more meals a day would lose weight. I'd ask why. And then when I did that little bit of research, I might find out that the 10 meals a day she was eating was all salad and fruit. And then I'd be questioning, well, it's not the number of meals. Maybe it's the amount of calories you're taking a day, etc. You're not asking that question. Now, to delve into this a little bit further into your thought process, I've brought up another video of yours. Here it is. Hello, Fat Earth researchers, debaters and debunkers. We're told that uh, this object falling to the ground is because of gravity. And I'd like to try and explain how that is a complete fallacy. Okay, we're listening. Let's just say this is one kilogram. And uh, it's said to have a force of one kilogram of force, which is 10 newtons of force. So all of a sudden this one kilogram object becomes 10 newtons and uh, it's apparently exerting a force just to be resting on this table. Okay, I'm, I'm listening, but that isn't an apparent force. If you were to put that on your head, you would feel it. You know, it is real. But it's just one kilogram. Whatever mass it has, in whatever volume or density it is, makes its weight. You don't need to talk about its mass, and you don't need to talk about its mass being pulled to or pushed towards the earth by some force. But that's just it. You can't move something without applying a force to it. You know, I'm not a Jedi Knight. I can't look at something and make it just move. If I put an elephant on my head, it is going to move towards the earth and it's going to crush me. But what is making something the size of an elephant move if it's not a force? How can an elephant be forced to move without a force making it? It, it doesn't make sense. Some external force apart from the object's own weight. And at this point, I'd love to ask, what do you think actually makes weight a force? Something doesn't have a weight unless it's trying to move down on those weighing scales. You know, or that elephant I was talking about trying to move down on my head. What makes those things move? What, what actually is it that gives them weight? This is where you're stopping to ask the question, why? Right? Why do those objects move? And then with this idea that we're spinning, we have to have a way that we stick on the earth despite our weight. Again, you just seem to be dismissing this whole idea. What gives us our weight? Why does weight make us move? You can't just say, oh, our weight is why we stay on the ground, therefore we don't need gravity. It doesn't make any sense. So, what's giving this kind of mackerel its potential energy right there on the floor, on the desktop? Okay, it sounds like you're now going to address the question I've been asking. Energy is required often in the form of a force, to lift an object to give it that potential energy that it will have when it's dropped. Hence the sound and possibly a dent in the table or the can if the towel wasn't there. Extra force has been applied by lifting it up 
into the air. But once it has done its job and hit the floor or settled in a state of rest, there is no more force happening on the can. It is just weighing what the can weighs. Okay, so this is where I'm going to stop the video because we've got to the point where we're raising more questions than we're actually answering. You've just told me if I pick something up and let go, it falls because I've put energy into it as I've lifted it up. So therefore, that energy is going to return it to its starting point. But you're not explaining why if I move something to the left or right or forward or backwards, why doesn't it leap back to the starting point then? I'm still putting energy into it. Why is there this directional component? Now, you'll probably answer, well, it's density. If I move something up, there's a density difference, which debunks the energy comment you've just made. But if we look at the density difference, then let's ask another question, why? Why do objects of different densities, different sizes and masses, why do they fall in a vacuum chamber at the same speed? And in fact, why do they even accelerate in a vacuum chamber? Where does that acceleration come from? You see, you've adopted a very simplistic model that answers very little questions and stops you asking the questions why. Whereas the heliocentric model answers all these questions. There are no questions that can't be answered by the heliocentric model. Whereas the flat earth model has so many questions that just can't be answered. Star trails, moon phases, S, P and surface waves from an earthquake. You know, they're off the top of my head. You can't answer so many questions with a flat earth model, yet the heliocentric model answers everything. You know, you seem like an intelligent guy and I'd love a response. You know, this isn't a dig at you, it's a, a reaching out, if you like, for a bit of dialogue. Now, Tuesday I will be uh, responding to Antonio Subirets, but before that, please, to play out the show, is Paul Douglas, with um, his own piece, and it's absolutely fantastic. Again, if you're a musician or into music in any way, please check out his channel. It's in the description, and subscribe. See you Tuesday.
I'm knackered. 